was so excited about my video for today. I'm doing another installment of five history books you'll actually like to read. Now I am a middle school history teacher. I'm also a history grad student at Cal State Fullerton and so I read lots and lots of history books every semester. Pretty much all a history degree is is reading. Like most of the time you have about 12 or 13 books per class per semester. So I've read a lot of history books and not all of them are my favorite and I wouldn't recommend every single thing I've ever read but I like to just kind of pull out some of my very favorites and then share them with you. I can be kind of your filter and just let you know which books are actually really worth reading and are really entertaining. So I have five books to show you. I've got my stack right here and as I was kind of going through each of them I realized that they all have a lot to do with women. There are major female roles in all of these books. So this is kind of like my girl power edition of five history books you'll actually like to read. I'm gonna try and go in like chronological order here. So the first book I have is Apollo's Angels, A History of Ballet by Jennifer Homans. I'm not sure if that's how you say her last name. Now this was not one that I had to read for a class. I just saw this at Barnes and Noble and I just thought it sounded really interesting and it had a lot of good reviews. I think for a lot of people, ballet is just really intriguing. Like the lives of ballerinas just always seem so kind of magical and secretive. And this book really opens up the entire history of ballet. So it begins with France and the classical origins of ballet and it talks about how ballet kind of has its roots in the Enlightenment and the French Revolution and then it tells the story of how ballet spread to Denmark and then into Italy but it was really different in those two countries so French ballet is kind of unique. And then one of the really interesting sections, the history of ballet in Russia. Russian history in general, it just seems so exotic and like secretive and like such a different world to me. So the interesting thing is that you can kind of learn about the history of these countries. You learn about the French Revolution, you learn about Russian history through the lens of ballet and how art kind of influences culture and how art can even influence politics and how people can use art to make a stand against a political leader or for somebody else. I just thought it was so fascinating and the very end talks about um, the American ballet tradition and there's a lot less on that just because it's so much newer and you learn about some of the choreographers, you learn about the lives of some of these famous famous ballerinas and you learn about the history of individual ballets, so like Swan Lake. I think I've only been to the Nutcracker Ballet, which this actually talks about quite a bit, but now I think if I went to a couple of different ballets, like Swan Lake for example, I would have a much better understanding of the history and I would be able to appreciate the story more and I would understand what they were doing. So I just think this is a beautiful book. It's so interesting. If you have any interest in dance or ballet at all, I think you would love this book. And again, it's just one that I know it's very thick. Let's see how many pages. <laughs> 550 pages, so that's quite a bit, I will admit, but this is something that you can just kind of slowly read, maybe keep by your bedside. It's just such a magical world to immerse yourself in. Plus, I feel like, again, you just learn a lot about the history of France and Russia and Italy and Denmark and even New York through reading this book. If I was giving it stars, five stars. Amazing. This is another one of my favorite, favorite books. This is called A Midwife's Tale by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. And this book is actually very famous among historians because this is just an example of fantastic methodology. What she did with this book is amazing and it really kind of changed how we look at doing history. So the subtitle of this book is The Life of Martha Ballard based on her diary 1785 to 1812. What this historian did is she found this diary of this woman named Martha Ballard who lived in the late 1700s in the United States. She lived in Maine if I remember correctly and she was a midwife so she kept a diary and she just kind of kept track of the births that she attended to and she kept track of like the money that she received, grocery lists and the things that her family traded for and the things that they needed and these were very like simple entries but what Laurel Thatcher Ulrich did is she took these very simple entries and she was able to write this really amazing social history about what life was like at the end of the 1700s kind of right after the Revolutionary War for common people, for everyday people. So often we learn about like George Washington and Alexander Hamilton and these really famous people 
but if you can find documentation from somebody who just lived a typical life, it can actually give you a lot more information about what life was really like. Plus, it's very interesting that she was a woman and she was a midwife. So basically, she was like a small business owner. People would contact her to come um, when women were delivering babies or even just if somebody was sick. She had medical knowledge so she could go help other people. And so one of the other really interesting things about this is that you see, um, I think it's her niece, um, be tries to become a nurse or a doctor later or midwife and she actually can't really do it because ideas about women change women are seen as too fragile to be able to you know learn about like the sexual reproductive organs of the human body and they shouldn't be seeing anyone naked and they shouldn't be handling sickness or germs and things like that so you see that a lot of times like women's rights kind of go like this it's not just like oh way back in the day women didn't have any rights and they've just kind of been steadily gaining more and more rights and more and more freedom this kind of shows just a wave pattern so that was one of the more interesting things to me about this book there's also a section where she writes about how her neighbor goes crazy and like chops up his entire family with an axe so you know there there is a little excitement and violence in this book if you're looking for that so if you're like a history undergraduate student this is definitely a book that you should read this is just such a great example of how to research and how to make meaning of your research. If you find a primary source document, this is just a brilliant example of how you can make it appealing and interesting and relevant to people today. This is a great book and it will teach you a lot of things that you probably didn't learn in school. Jumping forward in history quite a bit, this is another book that I just got at Barnes & Noble because I thought it looked interesting. This is called When Everything Changed by Gail Collins and this book is about the women's movement in like the 1970s and actually right now on CNN they have this um, kind of mini series called the 70s like they did the 60s maybe a year or two ago and now they're doing the 70s and actually this author Gail Collins she's one of the talking heads on that show. I was watching a little bit of it the other day and I'm like oh I know her I know Gail Collins she wrote that book that I like and to me this is so interesting because a lot changed in the 1970s and a lot of people don't have a very good taste in their mouth about feminism and about like the women's liberation movement but one of the things that this book really sets up is how constricted women were before the women's liberation movement. So at work women really were very discriminated against, they were prevented explicitly from holding a lot of different jobs. A lot of times people would hire a woman and pay her much less because they would say well you're probably just going to get married anyway and so you can rely on your husband's income, we don't really need to pay you very much. Women couldn't take out loans, they couldn't open their own bank account, so they just didn't have a lot of control over their own future. And she kind of connects the movement to like the civil rights movement and other things that were happening at the same time. She gives a little history of the ERA, which is the Equal Rights Amendment, which did not pass actually. We don't have an Equal Rights Amendment because there was a backlash from housewives who felt like the feminist movement was their enemy. They felt like feminists were saying that if you were a housewife and if you were married, then you were like a pawn of all men and you had no backbone and no spine and you were weak. So she kind of does go into that history, like that was definitely a flaw of the women's liberation movement. They didn't really unite women. The section that I loved was about sports and about um, the passage of Title IX and it kind of goes into like the Billie Jean King tennis match against Bobby, oh, I forget his last name, but that was, that was a really big deal and so sports were kind of an arena, no pun intended, where uh, kind of the battle of the sexes played itself out and I personally love reading about Title IX because I know that I personally have benefited so much from the passage of that legislation and I've always been such like a girl power type of girl but it wasn't in a way that like hated men like in fact my dad is the reason that I always believed in myself so much he had three daughters and he really loves sports you know he like went to college on a baseball scholarship he was a coach, player, all of that, and so I was like the athletic one, and so he really encouraged me to play every single sport, to go out there and play against boys, play against girls, be the best I could be. So I recognized that I 
benefited from Title IX just because I had the same amount of practice time as the boys in the gym and I had access to uniforms and we got the same amount of funding and we were allowed to have teams and be in leagues and get to go to games and tournaments when the boys did and that was not always the case and just the fact that sports were even like it wasn't even a question of whether or not I could play sports of course I can of course I can that's an attitude that women wouldn't have had in the 60s or maybe even the 70s. So I think one thing that I can learn from um, the Martha Ballard book and then this one is that it's not just a matter of time passing. So um, women receiving equal rights or anybody else receiving equal rights, it's not just a matter of like time passes and things get better. Like, no, something has to occur. Something has to spark a change and people have to fight for a change. And you have to change conceptions and you have to change culture and the way that people think about each other. It just gives you a sense of your place in the world and your place in history and what you have that your grandmother might not have had. Whether or not you identify as a feminist or whatever, I think this is just a really interesting book about the history of political movements and cultural movements. Okay, the next book is really, really different. This one is called When the Killing's Done. It's by T.C. Boyle. So this is actually a novel, but it has so much history in it that I would almost classify this as a history book. This book is about the Channel Islands. It's fiction, but it's based on things that really happened. So on the island of Santa Cruz, which is not far from where I live, just up there, there were rats who had gone onto the island when a ship back in like the 1800s had accidentally brought them into the island. Now they were disrupting the ecosystem of like the native animals and native plants on Santa Cruz Island. And they keep comparing Santa Cruz Island to like the Galapagos Islands, that it's this very unique ecosystem. And now there were these pests that were kind of destroying everything. So there's this woman named Alma Boyd Takasui, and she wants to eradicate the rats and just get rid of them so that she can save this ecosystem. But then there's this animal rights activist named Dave, and he is totally against that. He doesn't think that humans have the right to just kill off an entire species. So this author does some really interesting things with kind of going way, way back in time. And he brings in the family histories of specifically Alma and the history of the women in her family. And it kind of shows this struggle between like conservation biologists and animal rights activists. So from this book, you can learn a lot about the history of the Channel Islands off the coast of California. And it just really makes you think about humans relationship to nature and their relationship to animals and plants and how all of this can coexist without anything destroying anything else and i think the you know the ultimate point of the book is that that will never happen but how can we kind of try and find a balance I actually wrote a paper on this book about how if you look at it from like a post-colonial perspective then you see that Alma and Dave are like the new pioneers just with more progressive ideas and mm, that part is super boring but I think this is a really interesting book. Again, it's a novel so it's, it's easier to read really than any of the other books. There's a really interesting storyline. He kind of keeps you guessing. You get kind of invested in these characters but then sometimes you like them and sometimes you're frustrated with them so it's really good I think this is definitely a good like summer read especially if you live in areas like um, Santa Barbara or anything like that this is about your your territory your hood so this would be a really cool thing for you to read I think especially one more book that I just finished actually this one is I am Malala the girl who stood up for education and was shot by the Taliban and so this is kind of her autobiography she's only a teenager now but this is the story of what happened to her there is another writer that you can kind of tell throughout the story that someone's helping her just kind of structure the book. So Malala Yousafzai grew up in Pakistan in an area called Swat. And again, and actually this is weird that this theme kind of keeps on coming up, but when she was a little girl, her father wanted to open a school where girls could go to school. It was legal, it just wasn't very common. Her father's a really amazing, really persistent man. And he just has so much passion and so much patience. And he starts this school that girls are allowed to go to. And so Malala goes and she loves school. She always wants to be like the girl at the top of the class. She wants to have the best grades. But at the same time, the Taliban is starting to gain power in her region. And this is all true. Everything actually happened. And so 
the Taliban wants to suppress women and they want them not to go to school, they want them to wear burqas, and she emphasizes over and over that that's not what the Quran says, that's not really in accordance with like Muslim practices. This is just the Taliban wanting to oppress people and take away their rights so that the Taliban can control everyone. So it takes a while actually to get to the section where she is actually shot, but so you kind of learn about the history of how the Taliban took over or tried to take over in Pakistan and the methods that they used. I mean, they're very similar to like the Nazis. They wanted to eradicate anybody that was not Muslim or not a good enough Muslim. And they use terror, they use fear, they use violence, they torture people, they make examples of people, they drag people out in the middle of the night. This is honestly one of the most violent books I've ever read. Like, if you're having a bad day and you're like frustrated with things going on in your life and then you sit down and read this, you're like, I can't even imagine going through what these people have gone through. And this is not giving away anything, it says it on the cover, but the Taliban tracks down Malala in a bus with some of her friends from school and at point blank range they shoot her and two of her friends. But the amazing thing is that all three of these girls live. It's undeniable that there is a very special call on this girl's life and so she is shot in the head and then the bullet goes into her shoulder and she is taken to a hospital in Pakistan but there happen to be these two doctors from the UK who are there and they go in and realize that she's really not going to get the best treatment in Pakistan so they fly her out to Birmingham in England and that's where she currently is as far as I know. This is just a miraculous story. She was the youngest person ever nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize and you get a really cool sense of just like her life and her personality and the way that she jokes and the way that her family jokes. They're just such good people. They just do not believe in violence. They do not believe in doing harm to anybody else, even to the Taliban, which I can't imagine. I get so upset and I just want to like lash out against other people, even like on behalf of her. But she does not believe in that. She just believes that if she were to lash out against the Taliban, then she is the same as them and that won't get us any further. She has such grace and such patience. It's She's just an amazing person. And as a teacher, maybe not with the book necessarily, but maybe with a documentary, I think this is a really important thing for students in America to understand that there are people in other countries who are risking their lives and actually sacrificing their lives so that people can get an education and they understand that the only way that their society is going to improve or their country is going to improve is if people are educated and they would do anything to get an education. But it just puts things in perspective when, you know, even as a teacher, when you show up to work and you're like, mm, I don't really want to be here, that we are so lucky we have free education for anybody. You can come to school and get a free education and then get on a bus and not be worried about getting shot in the head. So those were my five. I will leave links to all of these books below. I can't recommend all of these enough. I think they're so amazing and that these are books that will make you a better person, a better citizen, especially if you're a girl that will just give you a sense of girl power and just pride in being a woman and all that women have accomplished. These will make you want to go to the ballet and to the Channel Islands and maybe not to Pakistan, but they'll make you want to watch the documentaries about Malala. I always just think that reading about history makes you a better person. So that's why I read history books. That's why I like history. And that's why I like to teach history. So if you read any of these or if you have read any of these, please leave a comment below. I would love to talk to you about books. I love talking about history books. So anyway, have a great day. Go read a book. Thank you so much for watching. Talk to you later. Bye.